For some random reason, an old memory popped into my head. That happens from time to time. I'm sure it happens to you as well. This was from the sixth grade, and me, not being exactly the best student, was looking for a way to entertain myself rather than pay attention in math class. That's when I was offered a book to read by a friend of mine to pass the time. And not just any book, mind you. There was a brand new movie to go along with it. It was Friday the 13th, Part 6, Jason Lives. And in case you can't remember, this is the one where Jason is resurrected from the dead by a bolt of lightning and immediately kills Horshack from Welcome Back, Cotter. Really. But this was the book version. This is what's piqued my interest today. I knew even at 12 years old that Friday the 13th, Part 6, Jason Lives was not adapted from some novel. This book that I had read was created from the movie, the opposite of how we think these things should happen. It was a movie tie-in or a novelization. And novelizations weren't new in 1986. They'd been going on for a long time by then. You can find novelizations going all the way back to the silent era of film. But then there was one novelization from a talkie that really had an impact. First big pop culture one was Marion Cooper commissioned a novelization for King Kong in the 30s. And uh, that one was the first really big one. It's always the earliest one I've ever seen. And it is based on this Kong script and even has a couple sequences that were cut from the movie. That's the first big one in pop culture that, that came around. This is Paxton Holly. Paxton is a movie novelization enthusiast and hosts a podcast about them called I Read Movies, which is really good, by the way. I got in touch with him because I wanted to learn more about this sort of odd niche that's existed in the industry that's been around almost as long as the industry itself. Naturally, when speaking with Paxton, I had a very obvious question. All right, so first of all, Paxton, can you explain for those who are not familiar, what is a movie novelization and, and why is it different than a movie that's based on a book? A movie novelization is a book that is post-movie production. So it is typically based on the finished script and maybe a lot of times not even the finished script, but a version of the script, whether it's an early draft, a later draft, the script is given to an author, the author kind of adapts that into prose novel. And uh, it's it's done for marketing purposes. Um, and originally back in the day when they first started doing it, it was actually done for prestige purposes because the studios wanted, want, always thought like, oh, if they see there's a book about this movie, then that kind of raises the uh, it kind of elevates the prestige of the movie a little bit. It's like, oh, it was a book. But starting in about the 70s, 80s, and 90s, it became more of a marketing thing, just to have something else out there that someone could buy. And uh, it's like before home video, you could read these novelizations instead of revisiting VHS. My name is Dan Delgado. And in this episode, we're taking a look at the small slice of the big movie pie that's known as the movie novelization. Welcome to the industry. Novelizations are one of those things that I think most movie fans are certainly aware of, especially if you're of a certain age. From the 1970s to the 90s, if you went into a Walden Books or a B. Dalton bookseller at the mall, you would see one on display for whatever movie was coming out that week. The end of the 70s and the 80s and 90s, um, mostly genre pictures and stuff like that would get, and they, they were... That was kind of the heyday of novelizations. You'll still get some now, and, but really, that's when the heyday was. But maybe you're like me, and you never paid them much attention, which made me wonder, how does one become a novelization enthusiast or fan? All right, so now I, I would love to know when and what was the root cause for you to become so interested in novelizations. There must have been a novelization somewhere that sparked this for you. And I would say my freshman year in high school, uh, summer of 1989, Batman is about to come out that summer. In May of 1989, about a month before the movie comes out, the Craig Shaw Gardner novelization comes out. And it's put out in, like you said, Walden Books. I go to the mall, Walden Books. It's front and center. They got a big display of Batman stuff, and it's right there in front. And uh, so I found it. And I and I don't know, for some reason in my head, I remember it's like, oh, this is the movie that's coming out. I, I don't know if I knew that 
clicked. It was like, oh, they, these exist. They make books of movies. I just thought, oh, it's a book of the movie. Awesome. I bought it. I read it. And this was like four weeks before the movie came out. And uh, that, that was the first novelization I did. That same year, I also picked up Back to the Future 2, um, also actually by Craig Shaw Gardner. So those two that year in 1989 were my intro to novelizations. And I just kind of picked it up from there. And the thing with novelizations is that while they are in most cases based on the screenplay, but since they aren't actually working off the shooting script, you might find some interesting differences between the movie. So for example, there's... Jaws the Revenge. I really dislike that movie. Really, it's not a good movie. And I, and I hate it. And so, but I'd heard things about the novelization. Someone sent it to me. I've had several donated to, and that one just happened to be donated to me because I couldn't find it. And I was like, you know what? I'll, I'll watch the movie again. And then I'm just going to read the novelization. I'm going to see if that, that helps. Does that help at all? Um, and I read it. And like that one is one that I hold up as like one of the ones that surprised me the most on any of the novelizations I've written. Just because like, if you watch the movie, there's like maybe one shark it's one or two shark attacks and that it's really kind of boring for the rest of it the book amps everything up they add like they, they add pirates there's drug running like hoagie's a drug runner for part of it there's uh, a lot more shark attacks the shark actually attacks the pirates that i was just talking about there's these drug running pirates like it just amps everything up and then of course there's voodoo they, t- they talk about the voodoo. But that's what I always heard about it. It was like, oh, there's voodoo in it. I'm like, how does that even work? That, that's, that's in there. There's a voodoo priestess. There's a voodoo priest. They voodoo the shark. That's how the shark is attacking people. It's bananas <laughs> in the kind of the best way possible. <laughs> so, wait, wait. Is the shark <laughs> attacking people because of the voodoo? Yes. <gasps> yes, it is. I and, but, and that's why they were, you know, the shark starts off in Amity and like follows the family down to the Bahamas. Yes. But that, that's all due to the voodoo is that's why he follows them. So as you can see, there is definitely some fun to be had in reading novelizations, especially if voodoo affected sharks are involved. But what does it take to write one? The deadline's super short. It could be just a few weeks, probably like a month, three weeks to a month is about how long you have to write them. It helps because you already have a script. So you already have like a story, you know, outline. You've got a lot of dialogue already written for you and the the plots there. So you can write it faster. This is Tim Wagner. He's an author in his own right and an occasional novelization writer as well. And Tim is a guy who actually grew up reading novelizations. It would be cool because you know what people were thinking. You get to see the extra scenes that weren't in the movie. But you could go ahead and re-experience the movie. Because otherwise, you know, like today, you just watch the movie again. But back then, it was a lot of fun to read those. So getting the occasional novelization gig is very cool for him. But what I've learned is that while there are certainly a number of similarities in each job, there's also a ton of differences. For example, there was a time Tim was working on the novelization for the Kingsman sequel, The Golden Circle. They gave me one script and they gave my editor a different script. And we didn't know that. Uh, and that one, I think, was one where I only had access to the script for three days and I had to reapply. And they didn't tell me that would happen. So I freaked out after the first time I got locked out. Uh, so I wrote a whole draft. And then my editor's like, what the hell is this? And that's when we figured out we had different scripts. So um, I think she sent me hers, I think, and we combined them. And then so we sent it off to the, you know, the studio. And this Honestly, it never, ever happens in the world of tie-ins, but it did to me. The director's like, oh, he has to come see the movie so he can put all that stuff in there. They flew me out to, you know, Fox Studios, and it was on a Friday. Nobody was there. It was deserted, pretty much. But the, uh, the, the, the gentleman that was in charge of like, licensing stuff, you know, so everything, books, toys, uh, whatever, you know, he watched the movie with me. But I wasn't allowed to use a computer. I had to take all my notes by hand and the director insisted I write down every line of dialogue that showed up in the movie and every event. So it took like six hours or more because they kept stopping the movie and rewinding it. So I made sure to get everything. And so it was a strange way to watch this film. And there's also an element of filling in the blanks that a screenplay is maybe missing for whatever reason. The four that I've done, each process was different because the studio treats the script differently. Um, Very first one I did was for um, 
Resident Evil, the final chapter, and I just got a photocopy of the script. Um, and they didn't have any notes. And I added because the movie before the final chapter ends in this giant cliffhanger where everybody's going to have this giant battle at the White House and against all these monsters. And then the next movie opens up with Alice just climbing out of a manhole <laughs> or sewer or whatever, and we never know what happens. And so I'm like, okay, fine. I'm going to write half a book in between and do this battle. And I just did it, and I didn't ask permission because I thought, well, if they don't like it, they'll cut it out, but I'm going to do it. They left it in. They let me do whatever I wanted. They didn't. They were happy. And filling in those blanks or adding some details that they don't have time to address in a movie can have some unintended consequences. And I'm not referring to a negative consequence right here. Usually it's positive. I had just at random in the that sort of extra half a book I wrote at the beginning, I had a character who had a, a Spanish surname. And I had a, a, it was a webzine website in Spain where they wanted to interview me about that because they thought it was so cool that that person was represented in the book. And I'm like, well, that's so awesome. I just I just did it, you know, to kind of mix up the names and things, make it a little more diverse. But I never occurred to me that that would be some kind of like, you know, a really big representation that would mean something to people. So that was awesome. And like with anything else, there are some novelization authors of significance. As Paxton Holly explained to me, there are two who really stand out. First, there's Peter David. And if you're a comic book nerd, then you are probably already familiar with Peter David. But he's also written a bunch of novels, and he's written a bunch of movie novelizations. And uh, one of the big ones he had was Return of the Swamp Thing. And that, according to him, that script was like not even done when he got it, and he had to write an ending for it. And so, like a lot of that was just him trying to connect the dots and trying to finish the story for that. It's like so the ending is a little bit different in the movie just because what he was given didn't have the ending. So, so yeah, Peter Davis, the big one that I think of that I, I pretty much enjoyed every single one of his novelizations he had written. And he's written a done, obviously, a bunch of the superhero ones, like all of the same Raimi Spider-Mans, the Fantastic Fours. He's written a bunch of those because he's got that comic background. And then there's Alan Dean Foster, the Dean of novelizations. Okay, I did just make up that nickname, but it has a certain ring to it. He was like one of the one of the first like big modern ones. He ghost wrote the Star Wars novelization for uh, George Lucas, and, and he's also his own really prolific author. He, he's written a bunch of sci-fi and a bunch of horror stuff, but uh, like he's also written a ton of novelizations. And Alan Dean Foster was definitely someone that I wanted to speak with. I mean, if anybody could give a proper understanding of novelizations and what it is to write them, it would be him. All right, so. Is this a lucrative business to be in? No. It's not. Oh. It never it never was. I probably did better than a lot of people. This is Alan Dean Foster. What I would tell people is, well, you, you take a book like Ben-Hur, and you have two guys make a screenplay out of it, out of this huge best-selling book, and they get Academy Awards for adapted screenplay. But there's no reverse of that. Nobody uh, takes a novelization, which is much harder to write a novelization of a screenplay than it is to get a screenplay out of a book and say, this is a great work of literature. And I'm not claiming it is. I'm just saying it doesn't make any sense that it's all one way and all one way the other. And I've always felt that way. Alan was already a published author when an offer came in to do his first novelization. It was for an Italian movie called Luana also known as Luana the Girl Tarzan. A guy by the name of Sal Freed had gotten a hold of the distribution rights and set up a screening for Alan to come and watch the movie. They didn't have the screenplay for him to work off of. It was in a small room inside a three-story walk-up, so MGM this was not. So Alan sits in the small room with the projectionist, the movie starts, and Alan immediately notices that the movie is in Italian but with no subtitles. And this was just the start of the problem. And it was atrocious. <laughs> it was awful. It encapsulated all the worst aspects of Italian filmmaking, bad Italian filmmaking. So I went home and I thought, what am I going to do? Well, Freed's young PR advertising guy was a fan. Mm -hmm. Not of me, but he was a fan, science fiction fantasy. And he'd had the good sense to hire Frank Frazetta 
to do two advertising posters for the film, both of which appear on the book, one on the cover, one on the back cover. Uh, the one on the back cover is a rough. And I thought, well, that's my idea of a female Tarzan, what Frazetta would do. So I ended up novelizing the film poster. And so by novelizing a poster, Alan starts his career of turning movies into books. Yes, that's right. A career which includes ghostwriting the Star Wars novelization that became a success even before the movie was released in 1977. The book was released in November of 76 under the title Star Wars from the Adventures of Luke Skywalker. And by February of 77, it had already sold out of its initial 500,000 book printing. And that's still four months before the movie is released. Three months later, it was up to 3.5 million books sold. The book went nuts. Nobody, it was just like the film went nuts. Nobody could believe anything connected with this Star Wars phenomenon. So when the film came, the book went crazy. It came out six months before the film. And there was obviously something there. Word got around very quickly. Wait a minute. This is real science fiction or prefer, preferable term science fantasy. Everybody said science fiction. This is going to be on the screen. I can't believe this. You have to read this. And people would tell their friends and neighbors and everybody else, you have to read this if this, this is going to be on the screen. I felt the same thing when I was writing the novelization. I thought, they're never going to get this on the screen the way it's written. But if they do, it's going to be something else. And in addition to being, a, being able to go to a cast and crew screening of the film, mm -hmm. I went to the first public screening of the film. I think it was 10 in, the, 10 in the morning at Grauman's Chinese Theater in Hollywood. And I sat in the back of the theater and watched the audience. And when the Star Cruiser came over, the audience went nuts. It was the first time in my life I ever heard a round of spontaneous applause practically before the movie had even gotten started. And at that point, I knew this is going to be something extra special. Allen wasn't just hired to write the novelization, which is credited to George Lucas. He was also part of a sort of contingency plan that Lucas had. If Star Wars wasn't a success, he at least wanted to be able to do a low-budget sequel to it. Allen was tasked with writing that sequel, which became a book called Splinter of the Mind's Eye. It was a two-book contract. The idea being, uh, to well, to write the book version of the film and to write a sequel novel and the only restriction that was put on me with the sequel novel, and I could do anything I want, which I did, was that it had to be filmable on a low budget. George's idea with contracting for a sequel novel was, one, to have more Star Wars material out there until he could put out another film, which he would hopefully be able to do. And two, if the first film was not a huge success or a complete failure, and he wanted to make a sequel film, he wanted to be able to reuse as many of the props and costumes and technical stuff as he could because he would have a much lower budget. So he's thinking ahead there. So it was a two book contract. And of course, Splinter was finished before Star Wars came out. Once the film came out and suddenly started making a dollar or two, it became clear to everybody concerned that George could make anything he wanted to. And he obviously, I'm sure, had other ideas in mind while I was writing Splinter, that were expensive to do. And in fact, Splinter, the original manuscript opens, there's a whole chapter at the beginning, which opens with a fairly complicated battle in space, which explains why Luke and Leia are forced down on Mimban, this jungle planet. And George said, you need to take that out because it would have been too expensive to film. Not because there was anything intrinsically wrong with it. So actually, Splinter starts with chapter two, basically. But as we all well know, Star Wars became a huge hit and Splinter was pushed aside for The Empire Strikes Back. Dealing with studios and major franchises is all part of the job for Alan Dean Foster. And getting back to how this job works, Alan does a great job of breaking it down. And just like Tim Wagner told us... First of all, you have no time. They want it yesterday. This is because the studios... Somebody doesn't seem to realize that it takes longer to put out a printed book than it does to release a film. Film's already done, generally, or in progress. 
So they won it yesterday. The deadline is almost always hard. There are exceptions. But by exceptions, I mean, well, we'll give you another week. That kind of exception. What I do is, what I used to do, is I would have typewriter, now computer, in front of me. And then to my left on a stand, I would have a screenplay. And I learned very early on that I generally need to get three pages of manuscript from one page of screenplay, mm. assuming it's a standard 120 page screenplay. That will translate, I know from experience, to 360 pages of text, which will be around 65, 70,000 words with the font I use. If it's a shorter screenplay, I know I need to get more pages per page of screenplay. And yes, this is a very sort of technical way of looking at it. But if you don't have that proper attitude, you'll get to page 20 in the screenplay and realize you only have 30 pages of book and there's no way you're going to end up with a book. So you have that in mind. You have to expand as you go. Now, a couple of the last films that I novelized, take the two Star Trek films, for example, I was actually able to put the screenplay up on one side of my screen because it was emailed and the movie itself on the left side and unspool the film as I was reading the screenplay. Then I would put the screenplay, take a printed version of the screenplay, put it off to the left, have my manuscript up there, just switch them all around. So I'd have three different things up at any one time. The screenplay, my manuscript, and the film itself. But they're very careful with sending anybody the film. Not everybody will do that. So they sent it in seven parts. Uh, one of them anyway, and when I was finished with part one, I had to eliminate it from my computer. Then they would send me part two. <laughs> wow. I mean, this is, they're talking <laughs> CIA level <laughs> encryption. And, yes. But I understand that. I understand that. Uh, and it didn't bother me. As long as I have the screenplay to work with, I'm fine. If I can get pre-production drawings, mm -hmm. if I can get particularly shots from the set, so I see what the actual backgrounds look like or or weapons or machines and of course the actors which who I want to describe accurately in the book so that when you're reading about Captain Johnston who is a six foot tall black man with an American accent I don't write Captain Johnson as a three foot six inch tall Nordic dwarf you know you people want these things to correlate <laughs> when reading the book so that's helpful sometimes I get a little more, sometimes I get a little less. With Alien Covenant, I had a fair amount of material. Mm -hmm. With Star Wars, I had very little. And so when you have very little, do you do you end up just kind of creating like your own world or do you end up just being as vague as the screenplay because maybe you don't want to venture too far off? Like how much leeway do you have to, to go in your own direction? Especially considering that you, sir, are an accomplished author on your own. You're not simply a, a transcriber. I, I have a lot of leeway. I assume when I start that I have a lot of leeway. If there's something wrong, I know that it will be corrected or taken out, or it will be, they will ask me to revise it to conform to whatever the finished film is. Uh, for example, The Thing, novelization of The Thing, all I had was the screenplay. I had no production drawings or anything. And it wasn't even the finished, it wasn't even the final draft of the screenplay, which is why there are a number of things in the novelization that are different from the finished film, particularly the ending, which is actually better in the version that I was able to novelize, not because John Carpenter thought it was better necessarily, but they're running out of money is the way I heard it. And the ending in the version I had, the screenplay I had would have been much more expensive to shoot. I do have a lot of a lot of leeway, particularly now that people know, people in the publisher, the studio, know that I know what I'm doing <laughs> and that they're they're going to get a proper novel. And since I'm sure you want to know, I did ask this. All right, so tell me, what was the ending of the thing? Because I don't know. There's a huge battle between I think the character's name is McReady. Yes. And the thing, and McReady has a bulldozer. Uh -huh. And it's it's a out on the ice in Antarctica. It's a very impressive. It's very well written by Bill Lancaster, and it would have made a nice ending, but it was it would have been extremely expensive to shoot.
When it comes to novelizations, one other thing to consider is that there are different types of novelizations. There's a novelizations that are based on the script of a movie, and the movie is actually based on a previous novel. So, or <laughs> I know. Please, can you give me? I need an example of this, please. <laughs> yes. So there are several examples. So one I would say is uh, Roger Rabbit. Who Framed Roger Rabbit was orig- the movie was originally based on a book by Gary Wolf called Who Censored Roger Rabbit. Uh, there was a novelization written on Who Framed Roger Rabbit by uh, Martin Noble. And uh, so, and I covered that on the show. So it's a separate novelization for this movie that was also based on a book. Um, there's several others. If you remember, Francis Ford Coppola did his Dracula, Bram Stoker's Dracula. It's <laughs> supposed to be based on Bram Stoker's Dracula, you know, mileage sure. may vary on that one but they did do a novelization based on the script by fred saberhagen so it's a separate novelization it's always funny to see bram stoker's dracula by fred saberhagen based on francis ford coppola's movie and there's one more type of novelization i'd like to explore this is the novelization that comes from the screenwriter or the filmmaker himself for example Novelist Elmore Leonard took the screenplay that he wrote for the charles bronson film mr majestic and turned it into a book Ian Fleming also, somewhat infamously, turned the Thunderball screenplay that he had written with other writers, including Kevin McClory, and did the same thing. Though that one did have some legal consequences to go along with it. And in 2020, filmmaker Quentin Tarantino turned his movie, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, into a novel. How do we categorize those? What do you think of those? That's hard because, I mean, especially the Tarantino one is just, it's almost an exercise it's not really a novelization. It's more an exercise in expanding the story than it is really just kind of an adaptation of the movie. Those are interesting in just that it's, I mean, I guess you get the original filmmaker's vision for it. And that's, that's always good. I, I mean, I like, I like to know what it's supposed to be originally, but I, I also like when it gets kind of wacky where it's like some other person's interpretation of what's supposed to be going on. Mm-hmm. So having the, but having the filmmakers, it's always, that's always a, Not always, but it can be a good thing just because you're getting what it should be. So I definitely wanted to talk to a filmmaker who had done just this. Yeah, Quentin Quentin followed me again. He copied me yet again. First it was indie films. Now it's uh, self-novelization. This is writer, director, and raconteur Witt Stillman. And Witt is the only filmmaker I know of who has novelized two of his movies. The Last Days of Disco, based on his own screenplay, and Love and Friendship, which was already based on a story by Jane Austen. Now, Last Days of Disco is Witt's third movie. It was released in 1998, but the idea for a novelization didn't start there. The idea started with Metropolitan. Metropolitan, from 1990, is Witt's first movie. I always wanted to write a novel and was intimidated by the whole size of the project, you know, getting a story and all that. And when I had a script of Metropolitan before I knew how to, to make Metropolitan, I thought, hey, this is the basis for a novel. I should send it to an agent I know because I had bought this novel that she was agenting and I thought she was friendly. And I sent it to her and she was not interested at all. I sent it right back. I hadn't made Metropolitan yet, so I was even more of an identity. And then I made Net- Metropolitan and did super well, uh, sort of Cinderella story after the usual rejection and ignominy um it finally clicked and a uh i still the idea of doing the novel and a publisher was interested a very good editor but i i really had to write the barcelona script and he was harassing me for you know writing the novelization and i didn't really have any really interesting idea for how to do it so with all his pressure i said well maybe it's best we just cancel the contract and he, he that's what he wanted so i canceled that but it lived on on amazon because he had put it in his catalog and once something is in a publisher's catalog even if the book is never written it can have a life on the internet um so amazon thought i'd written a novel for metropolitan for many years But Witt's novel writing ambition did eventually take place as Last Days of Disco was ramping up for its release in 1998. And then when Disco was coming out, I actually had an agent by this point and they sent it around and everyone said there's not enough time. 
well, these like not very distinguished normal publishers said, oh, there's not enough time to get it out before the film in time for the film. But then this very literary publisher and editor, Jonathan Glossy at, at Farrar Strauss, he said, oh no, take your time on the novel, have it come out afterwards, just do the best novel you can write. And in this case, I think I had a clever idea of how to do it. And it turned out into an interesting experiment. But again, he put it in in his catalog before I'd finished it. And then there was the hassle of, oh, you have to finish it now because if we lose this sales period, we'll lose all these orders and won't we'll get them back and you have to finish it. And so uh, it was the usual rush at the end. But And also it was a terrible career move because I think the two years after you make a movie is the time you have to scramble to get your next project going. And so it, I really took it, this novel seriously and it took a lot of time and it kind of killed me as far as career momentum. Although Disco had already killed me a little bit because it wasn't considered a success. And that's a shame because honestly, I love Last Days of Disco. But despite that negative story you just heard, Wit had no problem doing it again. And really, the idea of a Jane Austen story, turning it into a movie and then expanding it into a novel, is kind of a gutsier move. As with the first novelization, just to do a straight up, he said, she said, of the film dialogue and that kind of stuff, I just thought would be just too boring for the reader and for the writer. And I sort of had the idea of continuing things from the film, certain themes in the film, but it would be new, so it would be a lot of new material and new point of view of an old, old postures. And so there are sort of two dominant interesting characters in the movie story, which is Lady Susan Vernon on the one side, played by Kate Beckinsale in the movie. This really amazing character, total dominating woman who sort of can change reality through her brilliant conversation. She just talks people around to seeing things differently and and to, to totally dominating the world around her. And then this fellow who's a total fool, but kind of a triumphant idiot, Sir James Martin, who also kind of conquers in his own way. And the idea is that his nephew, so he has a lot of the idiotic characteristics of, of the uncle, is devoted to his aunt because Sir James Martin marries Lady Susan. And he defends, he writes a, a long defense of uh, his aunt that everyone has gotten everything wrong and that Jane Austen is a spinster authoress, is just a resentful social climber who's doing the bidding of the hateful de Courcy's. And um, it allowed me to get into a lot of things of interest, such as the use of the semicolon. There's quite a bit about punctuation. So how did it go for Wit the second time around? Well, both the novels were, were well-received critically. So the problem was it's very hard to get them reviewed because people so it's just a novelization of a film and they don't assign it or they assign it to the guy who writes reviews of five novels in the Sunday paper. So they have, you know, fiction in brief or something like that. And you're sort of doomed commercially, even if they love it, in fiction and brief, it doesn't really impact the public. So they're well received critically. And, um, you know, I'm glad they're done and out there. And if I write a novel from scratch, it'll be kind of fun because it'll be a tiny little bookshelf of three books. There's also a book version of the Metropolitan and Barcelona screenplay. So there'll be a fourth book. Let's sum all of this up. Here are the basics of what we've learned today. Reading novelizations can be fun. It's another way to own a piece of a movie you love. And novelizations can differ from the movie that they're based on quite a bit. And a movie you hate might have a book that you'll love. You also may find out some things about the original ideas that didn't end up in the movie, like voodoo sharks. If you're a novelization author, be prepared for a short deadline and be ready to fill in whatever gaps the screenplay may have. And those gaps can have a real effect on fans. And finally, 
if you're a filmmaker, writing your own novelization can help you expand your story and go in areas you weren't able to explore in your film. But make sure it doesn't take so much of your time that it delays your next potential project. Thank you for listening to this episode of The Industry, presented by Movie Maker. Visit moviemaker.com for more great podcasts, articles, and information about movies. If you love movies, want to make them, or are already a movie maker yourself, there's something for you at moviemaker.com. This episode was written, edited, and hosted by me, Dan Delgado. Special thanks to my guests this week, Paxton Holly, authors Tim Wagner and Alan Dean Foster, and filmmaker Whit Stillman. Paxton's podcast, I Read Movies, can be found in the Cult Film Club podcast feed. There's a link to it in the show description. Alan Dean Foster has also written a book about his extensive experience writing novelizations, in which he goes into detail about all of the novelizations he's done. It's highly recommended, and there's also a link to that in the show description as well. Music in this episode is from Epidemic Sound, and links to all sources used for this episode and anything else that I could think is relevant can be found at my website, industrypodcast.org. While you're there, you can leave me a voicemail, and if you're so inclined, you can even buy me a coffee, which I would maybe use to actually buy some coffee. If you enjoyed this episode, feel free to leave a five-star review on Apple Podcasts, Podchaser, or wherever else that you can leave a review. It may or may not help with discoverability, but it will leave a warm, glowing feeling within my soul. If you'd like to contact me, you can. You can email me. I'm dan at moviemaker.com. I'm also on Twitter at TheIndustry13, Instagram at Industry underscore podcast, and Facebook at TheIndustryPod. I'm also on the Repod app, which is a great way to not only to listen to podcasts, but to also interact with hosts like myself. Download it in your app store and come look for me. Thanks again for listening. And I'll be back again soon with another story of the things that went on in the industry. Be good.